this week. So very thankful for all the hospitality and good work that has been put in by the Spring Congregation for this. I appreciate the theme of this lectureship, Religion and Morality from God or Man. Sounds like a pretty broad theme, and it is, but it gives the opportunity, I see, to address some subjects, some topics that you really don't see addressed very often in Brotherhood lectureships. And the subject that I have been signed is one such topic. The historical Jesus is Christ a mythological being. This is a subject you just don't find described or discussed in past Brotherhood lectureships and Brotherhood publications. And so I think things such as this can be a benefit to the Brotherhood. The Christ myth view, the view that we are going to discuss this morning, is defined by one source as the hypothesis that Jesus did not exist as an historical person and that the Jesus of the New Testament was created by early Christians based on earlier mythology. I will generally be using the term Christ myth view throughout this lecture. Sometimes you'll find other similar terms, but all alluding to the fact that they believe that Jesus was some kind of myth. That is, that Jesus was a lie. He was a product of someone's fanciful imagination. Some believe this view is extinct. Brother F.W. Maddox in his Eternal Kingdom wrote, at one time it was necessary to write books to prove that Jesus was an historical person. Today no person, person of learning doubts that he lived. Well, it's been several years since that book was written, but we see similar claims being made. But you just need to hop on the Internet and look up one of the discussion forums that is discussing anything religious. And you'll find claims all over the place of people claiming Jesus never lived. Bertrand Russell, in his essay, Why I'm Not a Christian, implying why you shouldn't be either, made the statement historically it is quite doubtful whether Christ ever existed at all. You will find college professors, as soon as they receive their new freshmen, their new crop of proselytes as they view it, they will tell them similar claims. You know, there's no historical evidence that Jesus ever lived. These are people of learning making these types of claims. So it's not true to say that this view is extinct. And some people believe that this view is inconsequential. When Christ Mithra Arthur Drews sought debate opponents, we're told that the Protestants in Bremen politely declined the invitation to debate the burning issue on the grounds that the historicity of Jesus, though not really dubious, was of no religious interest. Didn't matter. And there are people today who claim to be people of faith, people who claim to be Christians, who deny that Jesus ever lived. I have a faith, they will say, but it's not based on an historical Jesus. This view teaches that the New Testament is a lie. This view teaches that all who teaches the content of the New Testament is truth are liars. The New Testament teaches that this view manifests the spirit of an antichrist. We read in 1 John 4, 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of antichrist, where if you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. This view, if true, would knock out the very pillars from under Christianity. Christ said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. If Christ did not live, if Christ did not die and triumph over Hades, triumph over the grave, he really never showed that victory over death. In 1 Corinthians 15, 17, we read, In Christ, be not raised, your faith is vain, 
you are yet in your sins. If there was never an historical person named Jesus Christ who came to this earth, who died, we'd never had somebody who died for the sins of the world. We never had somebody who was buried as recorded by the gospel accounts. We never had somebody that rose again. We are yet in our sins. Brethren, we need to be ready to stand against these types of attacks. We cannot dismiss them as extreme. We cannot dismiss them as inconsequential. We need to be set for the defense of the gospel. And as we look at this view, we need to consider a little bit of background information that might be in order that might be helpful. Let's consider for a moment the development of the Christ myth view. As tenuous as the Christ myth view is, that is, it really doesn't have any real substance, doesn't have any real support, yet it didn't ri did not arise out of thin air. There were various steps that came and led to the Christ myth view. Around the year 1700, there was an anonymous tract written called The Three Impostors. And this writer spoke about Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad all being impostors, frauds, charlatans. That their religions that they founded were all based upon falsehood. We begin with this to see very vicious attacks upon the Bible. We see very vicious attacks upon the person of Jesus Christ. But yet it is worth noting that as vicious as this was, we do not see this person deny that Jesus ever lived. Hermann Remarks would deny the miraculous and David Hume, Edward Gibbon, Thomas Paine, they would be, continue to pursue and to, uh, claim that the miraculous elements of the Bible were not true, but yet they never claimed that Jesus never lived. David Friedrich Strauss was the first to make the attempt to link the origin of the gospel accounts to pre-existing myths, to so-called pious fictions. And this would be very significant in how the Christ mythers would approach their, their uh, doctrines. But yet he never claimed that Christ never lived. Never made that statement. And so finally, Bruno Bauer. Bruno Bauer was the first to make the claim that there ever, actually never was a person named Jesus of Nazareth. He never actually lived upon this earth. And his views were very influential. Karl Marx adopted his position as the official position of Marxism. Engels would use, his, would use some of his statements to develop socialism. So we can see that this view has implications that affect conduct, that affect society. Arthur Drews was then militant and very cantankerous in his approach to the Christ myth view. And if you read his book called The Christ Myth, he makes all sorts of unsubstantiated statements throughout. Uh, you'll find various things being said that he just makes the statement and then says nothing to defend it. Like, for example, the fact that Zerubbabel was actually supposed to be the Messiah, but that failed. But there's never any statement to back up this statement and saying, well, where it talks about Joshua being a, a forerunner of Christ, they blotted out Zerubbabel's name there and put in that name of Joshua. He will say that regarding Matthew 2 where we have the wise men from the east who came to worship the king of the Jews, the newborn king of the Jews. He says, well, that's based on mythology where you have Orion in the west and you have the virgin in the east at the winter solstice. And so those, and I realize, I believe my hands are north and south and not east and west, but just bear with me. But you have a rock, and it's three stars there in its belt. Well, those are the three wise men. And they were traveling to the virgin who's in the east. And so you'd have that, and that's at the winter solstice. So they're bringing their offerings, as he puts it, to the queen of heaven. That's all based on mythology, he says. Well, there are some problems with what Drews brings up here. First of all, it's based upon a lot of 
misinterpretations, things that the Bible never says, but Roman Catholic misconceptions about things. The Bible never says that there were three wives. That's not something that's ever said. Regarding the winter solstice, all evidence, while the Bible does not say specifically at what time he was born, all, all evidence indicates that he was not born any time around the winter solstice. That's just based upon a pagan holiday that was incorporated with Christmas, at which time many denominations now celebrate the birth of Christ. But that's not biblical. And again, you have a problem. Why were the wise men traveling from the west to the east? And so he's making that to be a parallel and it's really not a parallel of what the Bible teaches at all. Drews claims that it's very doubtful that there even was a Nazareth in pre-Christian days. But why, if you're going to fictionalize a town, why would you fictionalize it as a town of disrepute? Remember what Nathaniel said? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? There were probably a lot of people who would have thought that here is this town of ill repute, of disrepute. Do we really want to follow somebody who's from this town? Paul, when he was being dragged away in Jerusalem by the Roman captain, and he was able, the captain was astounded that Paul could speak Greek. Remember what Paul said? It's recorded in Acts 21, 39. He said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. Because he was a citizen of a significant city, it made him willing to listen. It was made him willing to give him a platform to speak. If you want to fictionalize something, why not give Christ a more significant origin? Now, we have new purveyors of the Christ myth view. After Drew's, the Christ myth view did somewhat lay dormant for several decades. As scholars would largely abandon the Christ myth view and it's said to be left to amateurs. But in 1971, G.A. Wells came out with a vengeance advocating the Christ myth view, uh, re resurrecting many of the notions and doctrines of Arthur Drew's and others of his ilk. But he has since backed off much of that. Uh, he now says that there was likely a Galilean preacher who made the statements, who gave the teachings that we read about in the Gospel accounts, those parables. He actually taught those things. But he says that person was not Jesus of Nazareth. Earl Doherty. He has a website that is very popular. He's written a book called The Jesus Puzzle in which he puts together 12 ideas that he believes come together to prove that there could not be a Jesus, a literal historical Jesus of Nazareth. And all these pieces come together and prove these things. And he has been very influential. and He is pretty well the torchbearer of the Christ myth view today. And it is growing on the internet, and we need to be aware of these things. But let's consider a few arguments that are used by Christ mythers. How do they advocate this view? Well, one thing they will say is that Hebrews and the epistles of Paul or other epistles of Paul present Christ as only a spiritual heavenly being. That is, he is a celestial being in heaven. He never came to earth. He never lived, and he never died. Just he's always been somehow in heaven. Doherty appeals to Colossians 1.20, or 1.15 through 20, where it talks about Christ being the firstborn of every creature, talks about his involvement in the creation. And we read in course in Colossians 1.20, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And he says, well, that's speaking about a heavenly work that's being done. Hebrews 9.24 says where we read that Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, 
but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And so Doherty and others will claim that the epistles of Paul, that Hebrews, that they never make reference to an historical Jesus. They claim that Paul had no familiarity with the Christ of the Gospel accounts. And of course, this requires them to date the Gospel accounts to well into the second century. But they claim they have no familiarity with it at all. Well, think about some of the things we read in the epistles of Paul. In Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent his own son, made, in, made of a woman, made under the law, or as the American Center says, born of a woman, born under the law. Is that somebody who actually lived upon the earth? It seems to me it was. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. For I have delivered unto you that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. We again have it spoken of somebody who actually lived, and you know what? Somebody who actually did the things that the Gospel accounts record. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. For I have received of the Lord that which I also have delivered unto you, how that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and break it, and talks about those things that he said, take, eat, this is my body. Saying the same things we read recorded in the Gospel accounts. We have people who complain that you have these four Gospel accounts all giving the life of Christ, and now here you have these people who are saying, why, isn't, why aren't all these epistles again providing gospel accounts of Jesus. Each book of the Bible serves its purpose. The purpose of the epistles is not to give an account of the life of Christ. That's not its purpose. These are epistles that are written to Christians. In Hebrews 1.6, we read, When he bringeth in his only begotten into the world, he set them all, let all the angels of God worship him. Speaking about the incarnation, the birth of Christ. We read, of course, in Luke chapter 2 about all the ho heavenly hosts praising and worshiping the Son of God that had been born. In Hebrews 2.14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, Christ also himself, took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that is the power of death, that is the devil. He took flesh and blood. Human elements, describing that which is human, that which is distinct from that which is spiritual, that which is heavenly. He lived as a man. He was literally, historically, here on this earth. And again, it says that he died. The very passages that Doherty and others appeal to, even within those, they allude to, the, to an historical Christ. They refer to Colossians 1.20. And it's interesting, if you read the Jesus puzzle and read that section of the book, he quotes Colossians 1.15 through 20. And then in verse 20, it leaves out that first clause. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, and then he goes on. He leaves that part out, assuming that apparently nobody's actually going to know what the Bible really says. And they go on to say, why doesn't he make any reference to the fact that there was a criminal who was crucified who is their Savior? There is. It's right in that very text that he refers to. They refer to Hebrews 9.24. That Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands which are the figures of the truth but into heaven itself. So they say, well, he's there in heaven doing his work. He is now. But notice it says he is entered. That means that sometime or another, he was outside of those holy places made with hands, which are not, which are not made with hands, which are the true. He was outside that at some time. He was outside of the heavenly tabernacle. And it says, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He's there now. He is there now doing his heavenly work. But at one time, he was an earthly servant. Another argument that is made by the Christ mythers 
is that Paul's Christ shares many characteristics with the Savior deities of the pagan mystery cults. There is one gentleman who previously professed to be religious, and he has left his faith behind him completely. He says, you know what? In the first century, Savior deities were born of a virgin were a dime a dust. They generally refer to Mithraism. Mithraism. The Persian mythology. And they say Christianity stole these ideas from Mithraism. They say, well, Mithras, mediator, deliverer, savior of the world, all these things describe Mithras. At the end of the age, Mithras, the divine son of the creator, would be born of a virgin, of the seed of Zoroaster the religion's founder. Now, somebody who is hearing these things is saying, well, that sounds a lot like Jesus. Born of a virgin, of the, had to be of the seed of somebody, the Son of God. And as Arthur Drews claims, these ideas entered the circle of Jewish thought and there, that is, while the uh, Jews were in Persia, and there brought about a complete transformation of the former belief in a Messiah. That all, these new, that all these ideas that were now held about the Messiah were formed by Persian mythology, by Mithraism. We need to realize and understand that much of what is considered Mithraism was actually incorporated as Roman Mithraism. It's not Persian Mithraism that preceded Christianity, at least the foundation of the church. This developed centuries after the Persian mythology, and the New Testament itself may have preceded Mithraism in teaching these doctrines. And some of these claims are way overstated. Virgin birth, virgin birth, a dime a dozen. Was Mithras really born of a virgin? As one writer aptly noted, Mithras was not born of a virgin. He was born, according to their mythology, out of solid rock. I suppose technically the rock he was born out of could have been classified as a virgin. But yet they try to find parallels like this with Mithraism. They'll try to liken Jesus of Nazareth to Dionysus or Bacchus which is especially blasphemous because that is the Greek god of wine. But they'll say that he's just like him. He serves in the same capacity. He's said to have many of the same characteristics. Dionysus is described as he of the winnowing fan. Well, we know what John the baptizer said about Christ. Matthew 3 and verse 12, speaking of Jesus, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat to the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Must have been taken from Dionysus, right? Well, this was a common thing. Separating the good and the bad this way was commonly used. It was an agricultural society. It was something that they used on a regular basis to separate the, the, the chaff from the wheat. And we can look to the Old Testament ourselves, and we can find this figure being used time and again, Job 21, 18, Psalm 1, 4, Isaiah 41, 15, 16, many other places that speak of this figure of a winnowing fan, separating the chaff from the wheat, separating the good from the bad. We understand the use of common figures. If the Astros were to be playing in the World Series, and you were to go to, I can't remember what it's called, I know it's not Enron Field anymore, but if you were to go there and they are playing in the World Series and they were up three games to none, what would you see a lot of folks holding? Brooms. But you know, up in Yankee State, they do the same thing when they're up three games to nothing. Comiskey Park, wherever else it might be, they'll be holding up these brooms to signify the sweep. But yet it's just a common figure that we easily understand. So it was with the figure of the winnowing plant. Also the claim will be made with Dionysus saying, 
he was gloriously transfigured. We read in Luke 9.29 of Christ, we read in the Cana path as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. So we read of a transfiguration of Jesus and say, well, you know what, Dionysus was transfigured long before, according to that mythology. But the term transfiguration is never used of Dionysus for one. They refer to something that he reflected the glory of the Godhood. That's what's being said. But we don't read of it being any type of transfiguration. There's not even mentioned that a change actually took place. It's not described. So that's a dubious parallel. Another parallel that they will look to is the trial of Jesus Christ. When he's tried before Pontius Pilate, they'll say, you know, that's just like when Dionysus was being tried by King Pentheus. One made the statement as he was making this parallel saying, they look the same at their trials. Well, Dionysus is described as having a beard, but I think if you were to look at that Near Eastern culture, a uh, beard pretty easily found. And you look at the description that is made in the back of Dionysus and how he's described there, and you have King Pentheus there describing him about his long curls, about his fair appearance, and how all the ladies must have longed for him. It sounds kind of more like he's, uh, like King Pentheus is hitting on Dionysus than anything else. It really doesn't sound at all like the conversation uh, that Pontius Pilate and Jesus had. But yet of Jesus, we read in Isaiah 53, 2, speaking about how he would be at his trial and at his crucifixion, he hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And it would say that they were both quiet at their trials. We know that Jesus was quiet. We're told that he wouldn't open his mouth, he wouldn't answer some of the charges that were being made. But yet, in the back day, we read about Dionysus, and we see the smirking Dionysus engaging the king in smart alecky dialogue as part of his plan to humiliate the king into getting dressed in women's clothing and getting killed. That sounds a whole lot like what we see Christ doing, doesn't it? But even where we can see similarities, even if we don't immediately have an answer, there are some things that we do need to consider regardless. Realize that the Old Testament prophesied of Christ long before he came, said many of these characteristics that we'd have. In Genesis 3.15, we are told that he would be the Savior of all mankind. Right from the garden, we see those words that the Lord gave to the serpent, to Satan, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Saying that he would have a victory over that enemy of God and man. That seed of woman would have that victory. Genesis 22, 18. It was said to Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. You want to make the seed allegation, you've got to go way back to the time when Genesis was written. Fifteen centuries or more before the birth of Christ. And that he would be born of a virgin. That was prophesied. Again, going back to Genesis 3.15. It was said that it would be the seed of the woman specifically. We know that descendants, that genealogies were, trying, were figured through the male. But of this one, it was specifically said that it would be the seed of the woman. It would be a virgin birth. Therefore the Lord also himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a woman shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, Isaiah 7, 14. Jeremiah 31 22, the Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. Those prophecies were given long before Christ came and long before the doctrines of Mithraism, even Persian Mithraism, were formed. 
and that he would be the Son of a God, the, or not the Son of God, himself deity. And Psalm 2, 2 and verse 7, we read, I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee, the Son of God. And Isaiah 7, 14, when it speaks about that virgin birth, that she will call his name Emmanuel. What's that mean? God with us. God himself would make his tabernacle with men, would dwell among us. That was foretold centuries before. The nature of his death. Psalm 22 prophesied of many of those things that would take place at his death. Brother Douglas brought many of those things out last night. Speaking about how he would be able to tell all his bones. There would be those who would be parting his garments and casting lots for them, whatever man would take, saying the very types of insults that they would be hurling against him. He trusts in God, let him deliver him now. All these things were prophesied in the 22nd Psalm. Isaiah 53 would speak about his death as well, that he would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and by his stripes we would be healed. Centuries before. Zechariah 12 and verse 10. They shall look on me whom they have pierced. The Old Testament has well been called Christianity concealed. Christianity, while the church was not established till around A.D. 30, but yet long before, and in fact, from eternity had been in the mind of God, and we see it being revealed to man with the very first books of Scripture, and certainly it was revealed in some ways in the very garden of Eden. We read in Romans 16, verse 20, verses 25 and 26, it speaks about the mystery. The mystery of the gospel is being spoken of there, which has been hid, which has been concealed for so long, but now is made manifest. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. It had always been there, revealed slightly, but now made known to all nations that they might obey in faith. And also we need to consider that there may have been intentional similarities as they make certain descriptions. In Acts 17, as we find Paul standing there in Mars Hill, he says, For as I passed by, I beheld your, and beheld your devotion, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Was he saying that that unknown God was true and real? He's saying no. But there are similarities being made. Let me tell you about these similarities, and now I'm going to tell you about some differences as well. He wasn't made with hands. This one made all things, has given to all life and breath and all things, and we're going to answer to his son in the judgment. But similarities being made, and those were not considered harmful in times past. Also, another argument that is used by Christ Mithras is that there is no non-Christian record of Jesus before the second century. But to this, F.F. F. Bruce responded very well. Now, F.F. F. Bruce was a, professed to be a Christian, but he was certainly a scholar by anybody's standards, and he was fairly even-handed in dealing with things. He would not make a wild statement. And he has said that some writers may toy with the fancy of a Christ myth, but they do not do so on the ground of historical evidence. The historicity of Christ is an, as axiomatic for an unbiased historian as the historicity of Julius Caesar. And listen to this. It is not historians who propagate the Christ myth theories. But what about it? Do we find any non-Christian record of Jesus before the second century? We do. Most of you are probably familiar with Josephus and those things that he said and how he spoke about Christ. And he made some very favor favorable statements in one of those excerpts about Christ. They refer to him as being a wise man. It would be lawful to call him a man, for he is a doer of many wonderful works. And many other things being said of him, 
of Christ and went on to say, And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. Well, in a later reference, Josephus mentions the brother of Jesus who was called Christ, whose name was James. Now, what about us? Some say, well, there we have some problems with this passage because it mentions Jesus favorably, and yet this is not a professing Christian. Well, we cannot just look at things subjectively. We need to look at things objectively. And we need to consider, first of all, the manuscript evidence uh, favors the inclusion of that first passage, the one that speaks favorably of Jesus. All manuscripts of antiquities contain that passage, and it's quoted from as well. And second, it is possible that some portions of the passage are genuine and others embellished. Even so, it would serve as verification of Jesus Christ's existence. And third... It is possible that Josephus penned the questionable language that, that, that speaks favorably of Jesus. He may have been speaking tongue-in-cheek, or he could have been significantly impressed with Christ without professing Christianity. Philosopher Will Durant was an atheist, yet he referred to the life of Jesus as the noblest story ever told. He called Jesus the finest flower that has ever blossomed in the jungle of the human soul, this magnificent, magnificent symbol of genius crucified for daring to redeem mankind. He spoke of being thrilled at the mention of his name. But yet he was an atheist. It's possible that Josephus could have spoken favorably about him. And fourth, the fact that Josephus mentions Jesus, the second, that second reference, so briefly and without explanation, suggests that there must have been an earlier mention of him. Either that or else Jesus was already so well known that he didn't need to describe him any further. In regards, there's an example of a non-Christian record prior to the second century. But regardless, is it rather arbitrary to say we are going to discredit any Christian record of Jesus? Why is that so important? Are we going to discredit all Roman records of the emperors of Julius Caesar? We have the New Testament, which is a Christian record, and it is a reliable witness and is certainly relevant. Here is a book that professes to speak about Jesus. Why not see what it has to say? The New Testament has greater textual integrity than any book of antiquity. Also, it is found to be historically accurate. They have found that the gospel accounts, as well as the book of Acts, that generally speak of historical things, are historically accurate. More and more, as more time goes by, the doubts that people have had are refuted, as the New Testament has been corroborated time and again. And as Edwin Yamauchi said, the fact is that we have better historical documentation for Jesus than for the founder of any other ancient religion. I think we can be sure that we have an historical Jesus. Regardless, the Christ myth view will continue to have its supporters. This is not because the evidence supports it, but because some people's desires agree with it. Many wish that Jesus never existed. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad, and people don't want that. But regardless, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, that's one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day, whether you receive it or whether you reject it. One who adheres to the Christ myth you. That is the one who follows fanciful thinking. That is the one who believes the myth. For Christians can know that they serve a Savior to which no myth can compare. Jesus Christ is the only Savior put forth as sinless. Jesus Christ is the only Savior put forth accurately into history. And of all that have been put forth as a Savior, only Christians, can know for sure that they serve the true Son of God and Savior of all mankind.
He didn't, didn't I nail it? I mean, wasn't that presented like a general officer? You know, like, speaks with, with authority. I appreciate that so very much, Lee. I uh, couldn't help but notice, look around the room and see what I referred to as the old gray heads around. And it's great to see a young man with so much talent and uh, the desire to preach the gospel. And we appreciate him so very much. We'll stand adjourned now till the top of the hour.